Everybody, we are here with Liam Hendricks, all world closer for the to be named later now, right? Yeah, we're, we're currently uh, currently in between gigs um, and yeah, we're seeing what happens. But uh, yeah, I mean, apparently I'm not allowed to file for unemployment. So there's that. But yeah, technically I'm unemployed for currently. <laughs> awesome. So, so you can just between you and me, where, do you, where are you going to end up? I mean, I can put a good word for Atlanta. <laughs> to be honest, I have no idea. Uh, we've had a bunch of strong offers. We've had a bunch of kind of things moving along. And it's just uh, hopefully we're getting to the, the, the point now where we're able to kind of get those little little bitty details down and uh, and figure it out from there. But it's been a fun experience. Like we've, uh, it was nervous at the start because we didn't know what was going to happen. Then I had a good year, but it was still like, even if with a good year, you just don't know who's going to call. And so we had, uh, we had several teams reach out with which is good. We've done several little Zoom meetings and virtual stuff. And it's been a lot of fun being able to go there and, and pick guys' brains and talk to people, talk to front offices, talk to guys I know around the league and see what the organizations are about. Is it harder doing it by Zoom or is it somewhat better? Like you don't have to fly all these places and stuff. Uh, I'd like travel, so I don't mind the, that. Uh, it was good in the fact that I really didn't have to put pants on. So that was fun. <laughs> um, so we, my wife and I were doing the Zooms and we'd go like sweatpants on. And then it's like, we're, we look respectable up top. So... <laughs> that was that was a lot of fun. We just made sure to not get up. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to get into this until later, but I mean, you were known for not wearing clothes and putting or something like that in the dugout. <laughs> like, is this a thing with you or? Uh, so we the, the A's in the last several years have always had a thing, and um, whether it's been a like a mini basketball hoop where you take a shot, and they do like a player of the game. So it started, I, my first experience with this was with the Royals. They used to have a, like a neon bar light that they'd used to flick on for the best player of the game. And someone would get peppered with a bottle of water while that was all going on. And Jeremy Guthrie's on a table uh, clapping to Thunderstruck. And then, yeah, so the A's have a, uh, like they have a tradition where it was like you celebrate the player of the game or someone who did something cool in that game or something like that. And so last year it was a putting green. The year before that was a basketball hoop and the year before that was a basketball hoop, but it was one of those things that you celebrate the game. And I didn't get an opportunity to do it that often because, you know, relievers are people too, but we don't really get recognized that much. Uh, so yeah, every time I decided to do it, I'm like, screw it. I'm going to make a spectacle. So I went naked and surprisingly, uh, my one basketball shot I made, I was like, there was only three people who made it all year. And I made it on my one and only try. And then the putt, I ended up doing three putts this year and I was two for three. So I don't know if it's just that it maybe being naked has got a better equilibrium. It's a better, I don't know what it is. It just balances me out a little bit, but uh, it seems to work. Well, I mean, there's always a shot of doing that out on the bump too, right? I mean, you can pitch naked as long as you maybe wear a jersey. I think it's legal. I think it, just try it. I, I mean, mean, maybe just body paint. Oh, maybe just good paint idea. the number on the back. Yeah. I they've mean, got that's... the naked issue. They've got the naked issue now on uh, Sports Illustrated and all that sort of stuff. I mean. I need to go on a severe diet to get to anywhere near to that point because last person or was it Arietta kind of did it. And it was just one of those things where it's like, yeah, he's kind of jacked and I, I'm kind of a little sloppy. So <laughs> he ruined it for everybody. <laughs> Jake, I know he did. He did. He really did. But yeah, I mean, I, I would do it except all that, that hair and stuff would be disgusting. And yeah. That would be tough. Like it would be tough to be able to have to it, like shave everything and yeah, yeah it's just, we don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to brag, but I mean, if they're doing like a pitching Twitter, Twitter, uh, I'm speaking Australian, pitching <laughs> Twitter, body paint thing, uh, body issue, I think I'd be pretty awesome. I mean, you know, other than the hair. I mean, hey, I don't have a Twitter, but like I get tagged in a bunch of your stuff that people post on Instagram, send me links and all this. And then a couple of my friends just keep sending me all the stuff you do. So, I mean, you're, uh, you're definitely uh, one of the things that people look to. I mean, uh, you look at Jake Diekman's year. I mean, <laughs> you pretty much turned his entire year around, and now he's looking at uh, being one of the the better or top three or top five relievers in the American League, and should have got a lot more recognition than he did. He was insane. So, what was that like? I mean, your stuff is is crazy. Who on the team do you sit there and you're you're either playing catch with in the outfield, you're warming up before a game? Who do you sit there and go, "Holy crap, this guy is this guy's nasty." 
Well, I mean, over the last couple of years, we've had Blake Trinan, who just yeah. throws about a bazillion. What was bazillion. that like? It's scary because I don't quite think he understands how good he is at times. There'll be times where he, like in 2018, he was just so dominant. It was unbelievable. In 2019, it was almost like a little bit, he, he struggled a little bit and then it just kind of snowballed a bit. But last year, I mean, they, he worked back on that and was able to kind of get that over. His, his biggest thing is just throwing strikes and having that confidence that no matter, like, I don't care what the count is, you can't hit my stuff. There's a reason they call him the witch. Like, it's just, it's, it's insane. <laughs> I made that nickname up and he didn't like it. Like he made Well, me- I liked it. <laughs> I liked it too. But I'm, also, but I'm also a big fan of The Witcher. So it kind of uh, plays into the whole, into that like video game kind of TV series, book series. Yeah. Do you think maybe when he stopped calling himself the witch, that was what, that is what maybe took it away from him that maybe he should adopt that nickname again? I don't know, to be honest. It's like, he's one of those guys, there's always something to work on, which is great. But like there's certain times where he was, there was a couple of things with his sinker that he was working on. The sinker was nails. Like, you don't need to worry about that. That's going to be there. And then when you start fiddling around with other things, it kind of detracts from that. Like, when I stopped throwing my two seam, that's when my four seam started playing up. And so it's just like, oh, you always look at that correlation of, okay, well, if my two seam and my four seam are these, both these pitches, and then I took my two seam away, my four seam all of a sudden played a lot up. And it was just one of those things where I'd, I kind of pitched to what my strengths were rather than trying to continually change looks and all this sort of thing. Yeah. So how did that come about? Was that just trial and error? Did I know you've worked with Codify, who uh, I had Michael Fisher on, and it's just amazing what, what, what he's been able to do. And it's going to be even more amazing. How much of that plays into what you're doing? How much of actually seeing results like your, your eyes, uh, bullpens? What, how do you develop your arsenal? Well, I was disillusioned with my two seamer, the fact that it was good, because it would randomly be really good. It would occasionally be a, a good pitch. And so I kept throwing it, being like, yeah, well, no, it, it, it can be good. Maybe this one's going to be the good one. And it, it very rarely was. So when I actually stepped back, and I can't, I mean, it may have been Fisher who told me, it may have been, um, I can't remember what it was, but I remember seeing something, it was a statistic, whether it was just a video or something, where it was just my two seam, the, the numbers against it were drastically worse than my four seam. So I'm like, why am I continually throwing this? Like, why do I even bother? Like, what's the point? Like, I'm just going to throw a, like my fastball is one of my best pitches. So why would I throw a, my fourth best pitch is the two seamer instead of my four seam, which is my best pitch. Like, what am I doing with my life right now to be in that sort of space of mind? So I decided to bang it. And then all of a sudden everything kind of played up. Velocity went up, everything kind of increased. Yeah. I, I wonder how much that happens because coaching pitchers, sometimes you have that one pitch that is ridiculous. Like you throw it one time and it is absolutely filthy. And then you're always like chasing the dragon, trying to get that pitch back. And sometimes, you know, if it's one in five, a good pitch, is it really a good pitch for you? Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's like the, the, I don't like to put it as a drug addict chasing the high, but it's like, <laughs> it's, it's similar. Like you, you try and find that first euphoric version of it. And yeah, for me, it was just, it, it wasn't that. Like I relied on that as a starter because I was, it was a little bit of movement, but it wasn't much. But then when you get start getting into starting to throw a little bit harder, it flattened out a lot. And so whenever, whenever I threw it, it would flatten out and it would just be like a, just a, like a sideways kind of thing. And it wouldn't have any depth to it. So it's like, it was definitely more of a two seamer than a sinker. And I was looking for it to be a sinker. I wasn't getting any ground balls with it. And that's the whole point of a two seam. You're not trying to really miss bats with a two seam. You're trying to get ground balls. And if I'm not getting ground balls, as I said, it's, look, there's no point in throwing it. As soon as I stop throwing it, it, yeah, it seems to have worked out right the last couple of years. Yeah. Did Blake have any hints for you on the on the sinker? Who was working? Like, because you can always change the spin axis, or was it just really not worth it? I mean, your other stuff plays up so well. I still throw it. I still throw it in warming up. Like, I don't throw it in a game, but I still throw it warming up just because I'm trying to, like, uh, as I said, you're always trying to get better. And yeah, I, I spoke to Blake about his grip, his mindset on it, and and he picked my brain about four seam. So we went back and forth about two seam, four seam and the value of it. And, and like, I, I still think to this day, like he's going to be a guy that he, his four seam may not play up with the metrics wise, but it plays up considering he doesn't throw it that often. And it's a hundred coming off a 90 mile per hour. It, he calls it a slider, but let's be honest, it's a curveball. So it's just like, he, it's, it's those different variations, but um, obviously whatever he's been doing works. It's just a, uh, as you, as you can see by his uh, his contract just that he just signed, so it's a it's a good little deal for him, and um, yeah, it's I'm I'm happy for him because they're just good people too. Him and his wife Katie are just fantastic people. 
Yeah. I mean, the team overall on the A's seem like a bunch of good people. I mean, I've, I've talked to uh, Jesus Lizardo, who just has a, he seems like he has a great head on his shoulders, like knows what he wants to do, really sharp guy. But it seemed like the whole team got along really well. And I assume that had something to do with the success. Yeah. I mean, every time, like when you're winning, it's easy to come into that clubhouse and kind of be rah rah or happy and happy go lucky kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Zeus is great. Like he's got a good head. Like I don't think I've ever met a more mature 21 year old with the ability he has and the hype he's had coming through the system. He hasn't let it get to his head at all. Like it's just, it's one of those things where he's constantly trying to get better. He's constantly trying to figure out like what can be that, uh, that separator between him and just like your average top prospect who's coming up. He wants to be not only like a, that guy who's meant to be something, he wants to be the guy who is something. And that's, uh, I think, yeah, there's, there's multiple Cy Youngs in that guy's future with this stuff that he has. It's just, it's, it's just him putting it all together and, and getting to that point where it doesn't matter what happens. He's just going to go out there and dominate whatever team. But, you know, we had a really, really cool team between the mats. Um, they, they fit in really well. KD, Simeon, Robbie Grossman was an integral part of that. Mark Cannon is always on the mic, on the bus. Like those are the guys you need. You need those guys that just love the game and they're passionate and they don't. And then as soon as you get off the field, they're able to kind of have fun with everybody and poke fun at themselves. Like it's just a, it's a good thing. And that's, pretty much all we do in the bullpen is just make fun of each other. That's just how it goes. Yeah. I was wondering about that. Cause I noticed that uh, in some of the games you had uh, Manaya and Bassett going commando in the stands. What is it like in your, in, in the bullpen? What is, what is a, uh, what's your favorite story to tell? Is there anything or is it just uh, you want to keep, I mean, we have so many things. We came up with these uh, after Jordan Weems, it was Weems wisdom Wednesdays. Cause early on in the season, he had just a couple very like, like if you're on this path, once you get there, you'll know you're there. Like it's just like really <laughs> random, like Confucius kind of things. And like, so we just started creating every time he'd say something, we'd all just weems with the Wednesdays. It was just one of these things. It was just that fun little vibe. That was a lot of TJ McFarland and then JB Wendelkin. And then there was guys like Joaquin, sorry, you smell petite, uh, Jake Diekman, Bert Smith, when he was there, it's uh, like, it was just a fun group of people out there. And we all just made fun of each other the entire time. Like me and Joaquin would go back and forth about everything because we, 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 do, we do tend to have different views on certain things, but we're also to the point where like we can have an honest discussion. And then as soon as the discussion's over, we're back to normal and it's all good. Same with Lou Trevino. He's uh he's one of those guys that you look at his stuff and you're like, I, this is not fair. I shouldn't even be in the big leagues. If this is the guy who's in the big leagues, it's just like, they've got that sort of thing out there, like between Deakman, Wendelkin and Trevino. This stuff's stupid. It's not fair. I, I mean, it looks that way to me. I can't imagine going out there playing catch with them because Trevino, when he's on, is is just nuts. Um, it's just filthy, filthy stuff. Yeah, um, for me, it's like I'm. I, I I don't know why people like don't really like playing catch with me. Um, I tend to be a very, very straight fastball. So if you can't catch that, you, you're probably struggling to catch. <laughs> <laughs> So let's go back to like, how did you get started in, in baseball? I mean, you grew up in Australia, right? So that's like, it's not like a baseball hotbed, like where I am right now, Atlanta. Um, so what was interesting? Uh, so, uh, and honestly, it came when I was six. Uh, so when I was six, it was like, okay, you've got to either go to T-ball or cricket. T-ball was half hour. Cricket was like six hours. So it was one of those things where it was like, and a couple of my friends had joined the T-ball team. So I was like, I was really thinking cricket because – Australian is just you, you go to that but a couple of my friends started t-ball and it was one of those things where it's like you just follow your friend group so I followed them and then just continued on and then all of a sudden I was 11 and 12 and I almost quit at the age of 13 because I was like I got cut first cut from the, the state team then I got cut first cut from the reserve state team and was like I'm not even in the best 50 kids in the state like no I don't I don't do things half-assed I don't want to be one of those guys I don't want to just be like a filler like that's not my job I want to be out there and I want to be one of the guys and then all of a sudden the next year I made the state team then I made the top six of our state as the uh, West Australia Institute of Sport group that were being kind of groomed and primed to go to the Olympics and then it kind of moved from there and then I ended up coming over to the states with the twins over in 2007 just after my 18th birthday so kind of just progressed from there but I played football Australian rules football growing up my entire life and that was that was the be all and end all for me I was meant to go to that I was going to be in the draft I was that was my goal Baseball is an off-season gig that I just use to play a different sport and get different muscles acclimated. 
So we all know Australian rules football from like early ESPN. That was like one of the only sports they covered. And, you know, they, the, the, whatever umpire refs point every time there's a point or something like that. I, it used to be fun yeah, to watch. It's, it's one point for the behind. It's two points for a goal, which is six points. Gotcha. But so my dad's you... a scout. Oh, cool. So my dad's a scout with Sydney. So he, uh, yeah, I call, uh, he will call each other on like Saturdays and he'll be, all you hear is whistles going in the background and a siren because he's at the footy. But um, there's actually a USAFL league. And like I got, I almost went out to the, the Oakland Pirates, I think they were when we we're out there. Um, and I'm assuming Atlanta's got a team. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where it's, it's just, it's, it, once you delve into a sport, it's great. Like it's just one of those things that uh, I always enjoy kicking the ball around. I've got a couple Aussie rules footballs in my, in my closet and I usually take a couple of them to the season. Uh, last year we kicked the soccer ball around a lot more because people couldn't figure out how to kick a ball and make it spin <laughs> like this. So we got to, you got to take it where it can. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. So what parts of that sport transferred to you playing baseball? Like, is there anything, is it just the athleticism? Is it the strength training? What do you think helped you get good at baseball that, that Australian rules football helped at? Uh, probably a little conditioning strength. I mean, when you're getting like pretty much tackled, not wearing any pads, you kind of build up a tolerance to a little bit of pain, uh, which I needed as a kid because I was that kid who'd stub my toe and then start crying everywhere. So I needed to build that little uh, threshold up. And now I'm, it, it almost works to my detriment when I'm pitching because it's like I'll pitch through anything because I want the ball and I don't want it to come out of any game whatsoever. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it was just it was that like, athleticism, getting crushed by an opponent, crushing another opponent, feeling that kind of, rush of making sure that you you're tracking guy down over the course of 50 yards um just like that kind of engagement and the, and honestly the team morale like you're part of a team and it's you take the little things like you blocking a guy like in basketball you putting a screen up that's more important than actually making the shot half the time because you give the opportunity the space and you actually give that guy an opportunity to make a clean shot rather than him being under pressure the entire time it's just those little things that come into play it's uh because baseball is you know it's a very individual game it's an individual team game but it's a very individual kind of game because the little things unless you're bunting especially as a pitcher the little things don't really come up as much as a pitcher it's uh the bunts and stuff on offense but on defense it's pretty much just you against the other guys and that's what you're trying to do yeah that that's kind of interesting i was wondering what is it what is the view of baseball in australia um, is it becoming, a, is it an up and coming sport? Is it a sport that's, that's too slow for people? Do they watch it because you're there and because of Moylan and, you know, the success of Australia, what, what's the mood of Australia and how do you expand the sport in Australia? Uh, by you expand the sport by getting more Australians to the big leagues and then getting a little bit more news press. Like luckily with the whole, the last couple of years I've had with the uh, playoffs going on, there's been a little bit more of a resurgence of people getting involved a little bit and just trying to check it out because Heat, which is my local team, have done a really good job of and expand and get news articles and get different hosts of like different sport uh, channels to come in and, and say some words about baseball and try and get that kind of vibe going because they've, uh, they've done a pretty good job with it because uh, baseball is when I came over was a very, very tight knit community, but it was a small community. Like if you knew baseball, you knew who everybody was. And that was just what was what was happening. But now it's you get the average fan coming down and it's a good time because one, it's a lot less. It's a lot shorter than your average cricket game, which is nice. Uh, the big thing is we need to get somewhere where we can play downtown. We need to do some like events where it's a downtown event where all of a sudden you can almost see it as you're walking past. And then like, OK, well, what's going on there? Let's Google it. And then let's oh, let's see if we can get in see how it goes and that's uh that's the biggest thing is making it more accessible to the person who's completely unknowing of what's going on so having more parks and stuff where you can just drive by and say oh that's a baseball field i think maybe yeah. i'll stop by and learn it. yeah that makes some sense yeah just and it's just roads where it's like instead of being off access roads it's just parks being close where it's as you're driving past on one of your daily errands or going to get lunch or dinner or anything like that you can drive past either see the lights on or see a bunch of people running around being like what's going on down here and they get their kids involved. And that's the biggest thing. T-ball is one of the biggest sports in Australia coming through. But as soon as the ball starts moving, it coincides with when kids tend to fall out of sports. It's just about that kind of 11, 12, 13-year-old range where that tends to be in every country. That tends to be where kids start falling out of sports and getting into other academics or getting into their own kind of vibes. And uh, yeah, it just unfortunately coincides. And a lot of people leave when the ball starts moving. 
Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a little bit harder, although like golf, the ball doesn't move and it's pretty hard too. So that's, uh, yeah, I, I said the last time I played golf was about 2015. It was part of a charity event, and I made one good shot the entire day. And it was one of those ones where it's the you get a hole in one, you win a car. So I was very close to winning a car, but that was the. What, what's funny is with golf, it, it's almost like with pitching, like you were just saying, you have that one good pitch, it moves the way you want to, and then all of a sudden with golf, you know, you hit a, a 300 yard drive, and the rest of them are in the the trees. You got to learn to be within yourself. I guess it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, very similar, except uh, yeah, the ball's a lot smaller, and I don't, at least with a baseball, you don't. I don't have to go get it. The golf ball, <laughs> I have to go find it, and that's a whole thing. I mean, I if I play golf, I'm bringing about three dozen balls, and if, I, if it goes off, I'm not even going. I'm just dropping. Yeah, see, my theory is if you had a gallery watching you, they would find the ball. So if that's true, then you can just you get a free drop. I mean, yeah, it's, I still it's, don't yeah. know how guys in the PGA do it because – I mean, I would I would have killed like three people already by just shanking the living crap out of something right into them. Yeah, that oh, that that would scare me too. I can't imagine that. Yeah, but they're probably sitting there wondering how you throw a ball ninety eight, one hundred miles an hour. So I mean, you got that. This off. is true. This is true. I still don't know. So if they could tell me how I do it, that'd be fantastic too. Well, help me understand that. So how much of your mechanics, like what came naturally, what have you worked on? Why did you get good? And. Uh, like, help me understand your evolution as a player. So when I, before I came over, I used to throw against a limestone wall in my parents' house. It was this two, like two car carport that was long ways. So it was about 60 foot, six inches from this line in the pavement to the limestone wall. And the limestone wall had a strike zone, pretty much. It was just happened to be the brick. This was before, like they built it before I'd even considered doing anything to do with sports or anything like that. So it just happened to be that way. And, um, yeah, so I would just go outside and I'd throw and i just pepper that brick. And all of a sudden, all I would do is just pepper that brick with different pitches. And, and that, like, when I came over, I was known as more of the control artist, kind of not throwing overly hard, 88 to 91. Good movement, was able to mix and match and able to throw everything for a strike because that's, uh, that's what I did. And then as soon as I got to, like, I, my biggest thing was a mindset. Like, I realized this a lot later than I should have. But it was a mindset thing. In the minor leagues, there was a lot of times where I didn't know who was up. I didn't know who that guy was. So if I don't know who you are, obviously you're nothing special. So that was my mindset, I think. As soon as I got to the big leagues, I knew who everyone was. And then I'm like, oh, crap, this is uh, Alex Rios. And so I'm like, okay, I got to make sure I get this first pitch slider for a striker or he's always on that next one. Well, there was, I think he got me for two homers on first pitch sliders. So it, uh, it kind of played in that. And then I just went, I just started spiraling into the, like thinking of who's on the, uh, I need to throw a perfect pitch and all this and all that. And then the big turning point for me was, one of the big turning points for me was in 2013, I was pitching against Texas. I ended up getting to win that game, but it was against, I don't know if Travis, it was against Hugh Dobbs. Hugh Dobbs took a no hitter into like the sixth or the seventh. And um, Travis Black was on the team. He was like, look, why, look, my, why you look like you're throwing like a dot? Like my short, really short stride. It looked like I was just doing that. I was like, what are you doing? Like try and throw it. So I then got sent down. And then, then when I got brought back up, I got one more start, got absolutely shelled in Chicago. And then went to the bullpen and then was starting to gradually pick up my Vila. Next year was a up and down year between the Royals and the Blue Jays. And then when I went, finally went to the pen, I just was like, screw it. Like, I'm just going to go out and throw as hard as I possibly can. And, and luckily enough, I was around guys like in 14 at the end, I was around guys like Wade Davis, Greg Holland, Kelvin Herrera, uh, Scott Downs, Jason Frazier. So having guys like that around to, uh, to pick their brains a little bit was amazing. And then when I got to Toronto in 2015, Latroy Hawkins, uh, Mark Lowe, Brett Cecil, I mean, even even Asuna, because Asuna was that type of guy who uh, at that point was a 20-year-old who thought he was the king of the world. And having that, all of a sudden you're looking at him like, that's what I need. I need to know, just not, like, not care who's up to bat and then go for it then. And it still took me about another four years to figure that out on the field. So it was really a mindset change, not necessarily mechanics. Well, a mechanics change in that you were going with probably more intent to throw hard. Yeah. So I was trying to throw as hard as I can without trying to like dot an out's ass on the, on the outside corner. It was more of a splitting the cut, splitting the plate into halves. So I'm either going inside or outside. I'm not worried about up or down or anything like that. It's just split the plate in half. And then uh, in 2019, I kind of got to the point, well, 2018, when I got DFA, I went down there. I was like, look, I like throwing a lot. Let's just long toss every day. Let me go through my pitches every day. And all of a sudden I'm sitting there and I, when I got there, I was like 94 ish. When I left AAA, when I got called back up, I was pretty much 97, 98, 99 
almost every outing. And like even the catchers came up was like, no, no, it's not just a 97 now. It's a 97 with life with it's a heavy life ball. So like it's just here talking to guys like that. And I'm very open to my catches. Like, look, whatever I do, I want to I want your feedback. I want you to know how it's coming out. Like if it's a light, if it's a light 98, I prefer a heavy 96. Like it's just you, you want those things, those little attributes. And uh, luckily enough, I've been able to work with some fantastic catches over the years. So it was really like long toss airing it. You were trying to just throw it as far as you could on a line. What was your mentality in long toss? So it was a long toss on a line because I got to the point where I was from the line to center field wall and I don't really like going around the, the wall because then it also de- like goes into where the other team's trying to play catch. So <laughs> it turned out to me, rather than just trying to air it out and like throw as literally as far as I can, let's go to center field and let's try and throw as far as I can on a line. And so that was just one of those things. So I was starting to go on a line and then I'd always finish with the flat ground. So I'd always go two of every pitch to my throwing partner and then two of every pitch for the flat ground to my partner. And that's just, uh, yeah, I did that. And all of a sudden you start seeing the, the velocity increase. You start seeing your legs get under you a little bit more. And, and I'm always a guy, I, I love to power shag during the outfield. So that's, that's one of my only con- things I do conditioning wise. I just love to power shag. So I'm out there just pushing the center field out of the way so I can get more than him. So basically long toss, power shagging. I mean, you spend time in the weight room though, right? Or Very minimal. It's very like, uh, it's a lot of body weight stuff a lot of movement stuff just making sure and I, I shouldn't say a lot it's a little bit of a body movement stuff just because uh just make it though everything's like moving in the right direction like i don't like lifting because if i lift i feel like i'm doing too much and then all of a sudden i take the elasticity out of my muscles so all of a sudden instead of it being like if i do like shoulders or anything like that i don't feel like i'm fluid through the motion i feel like i'm really having to dr- grind and try to make this ball come out so i got to the point where i was like oh, and like Josh Cuffey in Oakland has been fantastic in allowing me to do that. Like we had honest discussions about, look, this is why I like, this is the reason why I'm doing this. This is what's happening. And sorry, here's my cat. Oh, cool. Um, hey, cat. She's the one who was on the wall during the playoffs this year. This is Winnie. Hey, Winnie, what's up? She's Winnie Sanderson right now. So she's a little bit of a witch, but. Um, <laughs> Shouldn't be, yeah, she so. be savvy as a closer, not Winnie. Yeah, but. Uh, that's a bad uh, joke. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I prefer team Winnie. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Team Winnie. That includes Winnie. possibly me say because uh, you know I don't I don't care if I'm uh, if I'm getting the save as long as the team's winning and that's that's what it comes down to. Absolutely. So that's interesting because I I assume there are people on your on that you've played with that are just animals in the weight room and you just and you're not that guy. But you're not a small dude. I mean, playing Australian rules football that's a pretty tough sport. So uh, are you just naturally strong? Uh, apparently, um, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, you threw the cat around like it's nothing. Well, she's a little bitty cat. Like we got, some, <laughs> we got some boys that are, that are weighing 20 pounds as cats. So, so uh, you, you yeah. can do curls with the cat. That's... For me, it's like, I used to, yeah, I used to do, uh, I used to work out a lot. Like I used to be, when I first met my wife, she said, I look like a serial killer. Cause I was like, for like 5% body fat and weighing like 210 as a six foot one guy. So I was a bigger, like leaner guy. And then it just turned out to be as I kind of got out of the weight room a little bit, that's when my velocity started increasing. So it was one of those things that kind of parlayed into that. And then I just was, I went a little bit overboard with trying that out to see how it went. And it seemed to have, uh, you know, paid off dividends, but I'll just, yeah, as I said, I do like a, just some core stuff and some hip stuff. That's, that's, that's really interesting because usually the easiest way to gain velo is well, long toss absolutely helps. But then people get in the weight room and they're able to build up. You may have been already there. Um, so you just need to maintain it and, uh, and stay loose. I mean, that's, that's. Yeah, seems- exactly. And that's just, I got to the point where my explanation for it is it's not about getting bigger or stronger or anything like that. It's about, I don't care what I look like. I don't care how I'm doing things. As long as everything comes out the right way on the mound, that's all that matters. So it's like, I'm not going to try and be in a better position physically to be worse on the mound. I prefer to be in a point in a position where everything flows and I'm not also changing the way I feel on a daily basis by either doing legs one day, upper body the other day and core. Like I'm not changing the way I feel. So everything is able to kind of be repeated a lot easier. But it's worse for the the body edition when they have that. So Yeah. I mean, I mean unless it's just an out of shape body edition, which I'd be all part of. <laughs> awesome. So get me to the mentality that you take to the mound how did it differ from being a 
starter to a closer? How did Codify play into it? Because this is what I found interesting talking to uh, to Michael Fisher about Codify. It's almost like it takes one thing away from your thought pattern. You just know, hey, I, if I throw that pitch there, I have a better chance of being successful. Doesn't mean I will, but it takes one less complicated thing from it. And I think it plays really well into the mental game. So I was just wondering how this worked for you, how the mental game, how you generally view it. Cause I've seen you on the mound and you look like sometimes you want to kill somebody. So uh, yeah, I think that really helped me having the ability to go out there and show my emotions. Like I was a very tempered, like I was very, I'm don't get me wrong. I'm loud and obnoxious off the field, but I was very like, I tried to be locked down. I tried to be serious. I tried to be all this. And then, I've realized that when I do the best work is when I'm just yelling and cussing and screaming it mainly myself, but sometimes the opposition, it just depends. Like there was a game this year where one of the dugouts was chirping a little bit. And so I struck a guy out and then I yelled at their dugout and struck the next guy out, yelled at their dugout and they're still chirping a little bit, struck the last guy out, yelled at their dugout as I'm walking off. So it's just, uh, it's just one of those things I've like, uh, yeah, but uh, codify the biggest thing that helped me was there was two things that, that have really changed my perspective on everything was codify is a very positive version of everything their version is this is where he's gotten out not this is where you should stay away from so it's very much like okay he gets himself out here not where this is where he does all this damage because if you tell me like okay well this is if you you really can't get a fastball away to this guy because that's where it takes the ball the other way and he does a good job of it well i'm going to try and go in and then i'm going to miss in and then be forced to go away and then and if I get if I you tell me like, oh yeah, this guy's got a complete hole inside, okay, perfect. Inside, inside, inside. It's just that little bit of a little bit of an adjustment, just kind of in the in the mental aspect of making sure it's a positive attitude towards it rather than a negative. And then the other thing was is like you've seen the match to get into the blue stuff. It's fascinating because there was a couple of times where I'd give up a hit or a hard hit ball or anything like that. And then I look at the map afterwards and I'm like, okay, that, that was in the blue. It's a complete anomaly. Like I don't my stuff's still exactly the same. It's fine. And then like, I loved the fact this year, like obviously my first outing of the year, I blew the save, gave up a run, loaded the bases and luckily was able to get out of it. But then watching the video, talking to Fisher, it was like, no, no, my stuff's completely fine. I need to get out of my own head thinking that I'm not back to where I was last year. Cause I'm always tend to be coming through at the start of the season. I tend to be a mile or two slower than, than the middle of the year. And then at the end of the year, I tend to be a mile or two harder. It's just the way my body kind of progresses. I get used to the the drive and everything like that and get used to the – like I love the monotony of a regular season because everything is exactly the same every day. Throwing program, uh, tend to be trying to be what I eat, trying to like do all this. It's just I do everything the exact same. I read a book or I make a little figurine. It's just having that kind of itemized list of the way I go through things is uh, is beneficial to my mindset. But always look at the maps. I have them on the mound with me, print it out, and uh, go through the next – I generally go through the next three, sometimes four hitters because I trust myself. I'm like, okay, well, I don't have to look at the fourth or the fifth guy because I got these three guys out anyway. And then I, I get on the mound and yell as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite moments was the Reddick K. Uh, I don't know if you – I mean, I assume you remember that. Uh, oh, I remember. I, I text my wife because I know Josh really well. I love Josh. He's awesome. Uh, I was like, should I text him now or should I wait a couple of days? He's just like, <laughs> you should wait. <laughs> he broke his bat on that one. I was going to give him props on that. Like, that's good for him. Like, I've seen a lot of people try that and not work. So the fact that he was able to do it, I'm going to give him credit for it because that's, that's amazing. Yeah, to so me. Me and Josh that... have a friendly rivalry going. He's uh, He's got a lot of first pitch hits off me in the past. So, I, like, every time I get him, it's just a little, little, little uh, witty banter. See, I love that just as somebody that loves pitching and loves the game. I was watching it. I think actually when it happened, I was like, this is baseball to me. Like you got a pissed off hitter, a pitcher that's yelling at the top of his lungs, the friendly rivalry. To me, that is the best part about the sport. Um, so I, was, I love that insight on it. Yeah, and that's what I love. Like I'm all for hitters doing their bat flips and all this. Because it's like, hey, look, if you get it, you got it. That's good. Good for you. But if I get you, I'm going to scream as loud as I possibly can because that's my version of a bat flip. Exactly. I, I totally, totally agree with that. Um, so let's touch on some of your pitch grips. Um, I would love to see you walk through them. And even let, let's – you can touch on the two-seamer, too, that apparently is, is kind of uh, – Yeah. 
I got a fancy ball. It's a, uh, I don't know if you, it's an Eastern League ball. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Back from my 2000, uh, 2011 days when I was at the new Breton Rockcats. Nice. It's uh, now no longer a, uh, a fishy a, affiliated team. But yeah, like I'm pretty, like my stuff, I feel like it's pretty normal. Like the only thing I did, I've, because I've broken my fingers enough times, <laughs> they, uh, my fingers tend to be a little odd, but my big thing, I've always, I tried to explain it to a couple guys this year, whereas he's like the Rollings logo I use as a guideline. So it's like, I want to be as long as along that. Cause I want to be releasing the ball perfectly forcing. So I don't want to be like oh, a little off kilter or a little have more ball this way or more ball that way. So I want to be at this point, right along the four seam grip. And I want that ball to come out as a perfect four seam because that's where you're going to get that little ride. The spin efficiency comes through. You're able to get more spin rate on the ball. And it, it tends to be able to defy gravity just a little bit longer, which is, uh, which is what I'm aiming for with my four seam. How big are you into spin efficiency and your metrics? I'm just curious. I love it pregame. Pre-game, I'm all about it. Um, then in post and like during the game, like Texas, their new stadium, they have the spin rate and stuff like that on the video board. So as I'm pitching there, I kind of look back and had a look at it and I'm like, okay, well, that one wasn't good. The next one, like, try this. Oh, that one's better. Okay. But it was nothing that I'm like really overly concerned about because at the end of the day, pre-game, it's all good because I want to make sure that I'm pretty much consistent with spin efficiency, with my spin axis, with uh, my release point, with where I'm at on the plate. Like, I want to make sure that's all consistent. And that's when I like looking at that stuff. But during the game, I mean, I don't care. Like at the end of the day, if I have something that is completely off from what I used to do and the guy swings and misses, that's all I care about. I don't care about the in-game stuff as much as I do is seeing where I'm at and trying to break every record possible. So um, that's why I loved having like a Diekman or a Trevino or uh, Frankie Montas in, the, in, in that team because all of it is, is a, I, okay, you want to throw harder than me? No, no, no. I'm going to come out here. I'm going to throw harder than you. And this is, this is going to be where I went. And this is a, it's a competition. Everything's a competition at all times, always. I love that. And part of it is so, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll fast forward to, to the rest of uh, your arsenal, but mentality wise, are you thinking about like velo command movement? What jumps out at you when you're pitching? What do you strive for? And what do you think gets hitters out on that? Uh, to be honest, I think the biggest thing for me is making sure that I, I trust my fastball in any situation, any count, at any point in time. So me, it's just trying to throw as hard as I possibly can up in the zone. And then everything else kind of, there'll be a lot of times where I'm like, I'm trying to get it away to a righty or I'm trying to get it away to a lefty or anything like that. But at the end of the day, like put it right down the middle. I'm trying to throw as hard as I can. And then I have an idea of where I'm trying to get to. But, uh, and then the movement takes care of itself. If you try start worrying about movement, you just, that, that's when everything goes downhill because I'm not trying to get any movement. I'm trying to take the movement away. So I, I think uh, your messed up fingers probably help with some movement too, just now. Yeah. A little bit of that. Like, uh, yeah, it's just, it's that, it's that little thing. And I can do, <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but I have a catapult finger. Dude. So I, don't what, I don't know how I did that. I think it was just because a giant thing is like a football coming in like that. And then, but it's one of those things where it's like, you, you get to that point where you can do that with your hand. And I don't know. Uh, I'm, <laughs> yeah. The worst part is the fingers are like, the most coordinated part of me the rest of me is just completely like it's it's a joke <laughs> <laughs> so next we have let's see a uh, slider grip so my Sli slide I have slider that's your nickname slider. so it's yeah. yeah slider so i have three different ones depending on how i'm feeling so like uh, and it, they all move roughly the same it's just how i feel throwing them so the first one during when i when i generally start in spring training i've got my like so my that's the horseshoe, and I'm pretty much the entire middle finger on the ball. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah, yep. the entire middle finger on the ball. And then that's just the bigger one that's going to be a little slow, a little bit more movement. And then I go back, and then I start putting, like, this part of my finger, the knuckle there, on the horseshoe, so it's like that. And then that's the same thing, and it's just that. And then if I'm feeling really good and really frisky and it's got, got good movement, if I want it to be a little harder, I tend to just put the tip of my finger on the horseshoe and then just grip it and rip it. But my thing with the slider is always you go there and you just open the doorknob. You just got to twist the doorknob. So it's just, I don't know. I can't remember who told me that. Someone has told me that euphemism. And I was just getting there and then it's just like, you're opening a your doorknob. And so ever since that, I've just had that kind of vibe to it. And I just try and throw as hard as, as, hard as I possibly can. The movement will be there. It's just trying to throw as hard as I can. 
So some people will preset it and they rely on the grip to do it. You're actually, you, you're like, you're manipulating the ball a little bit by, by twisting yeah. the doorknob at the very end. Yeah. So it's just, it's thinking fossil, 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 doorknob. And then that's why I feel like I have a little bit more depth to it. Cause I'm coming like that. So it's just, you've got that kind of, it's all off the middle finger, it's all off the middle finger. It's just that kind of twist down and you turn, sometimes it turns into like a little, like a baby sharp curve ball, but I, I yeah, as long as at the end, as long as it looks like a fastball for most of the time, that's all I care about. Which was that catapult finger again? Is that your middle finger or pointer finger? So I just want to know. Pointer. That. Okay. So you don't, you're not using the catapult to. Uh... No, I've tried it. Just I, I've tried. <laughs> I, Unless I lock it out, like with a fastball back here, like I can't do anything with it. I've tried multiple times to try and figure that out. It's just a cool party trick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's nasty. I like it though. Um, so you also have a knuckle curve, right? And that's just your basic one, like nail in the horseshoe there and then finger around there. And this one is, this one, the credit all goes to Danny Coulomb. So I don't know if you've ever seen Danny Coulomb pitch. He throws like, I think it's like 80% breaking balls or something like that. And his curveball is disgusting. Like he'll throw, like he's got three different curveballs the way I have different slides, but he has different movement on his. So it's like he has his normal one. Then he has his two strike one. Then he has the hard curveball. He tries to throw as hard as he possibly can. That thing's disgusting. But yeah, all what it was is like I tried to throw the spikes for years. Could not never get the grasp of it. Play catch with him a couple of times when I was in oh, a lot when I was in AAA in the outfield during batting practice, and it was just just flicking it in there, trying to get that motion, trying to get that vibe to it. And then uh, yeah, started taking it in, and now it's now it's my go-to curveball because it's just my other one was tend to be slow, loopy, a little bit more movement, but tend to be slow, loopy, and and pop out of the hand. Whereas the knuckle curve tends to have that little kind of off the table kind of vibe to it. So what are you doing with your middle finger again? You're, are you just trying to get to the front of the ball or you, you're just throwing it like it's staying behind like a fastball? I'm just trying to say like, I so I get here and then it's like, I'm the entire way I'm trying to like fastball, fastball. As soon as I get up on top, I'm that. And then it's that way. So gotcha. I'm like, I'm not like pushing it forward or anything like that. Like some guys do, I'm just trying to grip it and rip it down. But this is able to kind of cock my wrist a little bit. So I'm actually able to get that snap to it rather than when I was here. I was never able to kind of snap it up as much. It was just, that just has helped me get it out. And I, when I had my old curveball grip, I was always trying to get it to 80 and I never could. As soon as I went to the spike curve, now I'm throwing it, like now I'm trying to slow it down a little bit because it tends to be too hard sometimes. I got it up to like 85, 86 last year when my slider was 87. So it's just a little bit, it's like Grinky's change up. It, it, it was effective. It was just, I, I want the speed differential in there. So I kind of noticed that actually, there were a couple of times where I had a hard time telling if it was a knuckle curve or a slider, mm -hmm. just because of angles or whatever. And I couldn't tell velo wise, but it was creeping up to where they were a little bit identical, a little bit different movement. I mean, obviously you get a, a little sharper, well, a little more 12, six action on your curveball, but it's hard to tell on some of this, some of the angles. Yeah. Especially early in the year, early in the year is when my slider tends to be a little bit bigger. My curveball tends to like the velo on the curveball doesn't really change too much, but the, uh, yeah, the slider does. The slider fluctuates a little bit. So at the start of the year, it tends to be a little bit bigger and more 86, 87-ish. And towards the end of the year, when everything starts kind of locking into place where I need it to be, it tends that's when it tends to be anywhere from 88 to 92. And that's where I'd – like I, ideally I'd be 98 with a fastball, 92 with a slider, 84 with a curveball, just to have that kind of speed different, like the traction. So all of a sudden, if he's out in front of a slider – okay, well, I go to the curveball. Or if he's behind the slider, I go to the fastball or vice versa and mix and match and just trying to make sure you get that timing off. But uh, yeah, that, that's in an ideal world. But the start of the season very is, is very rarely an ideal world. Yeah, especially last season when it, you never knew when the season was going to start. That, that was, was the a, worst part. I felt so terrible. good in regular spring training. I felt so good. And then I get three bullpens into the quarantine period and strain my oblique. So then I was rehabbing that the entire time. And then got about three or four bullpens in. Oh, sorry, two or three full-time bullpens in before leaving Arizona. We just stayed in Arizona. It was just easier. So we stayed in Arizona and then went to Oakland. And then I had I was on an artificial mound for a little bit. And then that got me all just sort of discombobulated. And then the we get out to Oakland now putting in the uh, – the, uh, they took out the – I think it was Hawkeye they put in mm -hmm. as their new system. So they're putting Hawkeye in, but it hadn't been calibrated right so that we were sitting there and all the pitches were two miles an hour lower, but nobody knew the pitchers didn't know the hitters all assumed, but nobody knew for sure. The pitchers had no idea. So we all thought we were sucking. <laughs> so that was, that was 
that was tough. Like I'm sitting up there, I'm rearing it back and I'm looking and I'm seeing 92, 93. I'm like, am I that far off? Like what's going on? Turns out I wasn't on, but I wasn't that far off. I'd noticed that in the, as well with some, sometimes it was too fast too. I thought uh, Kyle Hendricks was hitting like 92 and I was like, he's not. Uh, no such, no such thing as too fast. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's just not happening. So how do you choose? So you touched on it. So are you reading the hitters' swings and approaches? Is it about your catcher calling it? How much do you pay attention to what the hitter's trying to do when you're trying to choose what pitch to throw? Uh, so a lot of it, like, it first comes down, I look at the codify stuff before the game and be like, okay, who's better at a curveball? Who's better at a slider? That's my biggest thing because I know and, and where do I throw my fastball? Is it up? Is it down? Is it in? Is it out? And then the, other than that, it's uh, as soon as the game starts, I usually forget it all anyway. But then I read the hitter and it's like, okay, well, he was late on a fastball there, so I'm not going to throw a slider. If I, I'm going to go back to the fastball, or I'm going to throw a curveball, which has that little bit more speed differential. And then from that, like if if you swing and miss at a fastball, you're getting it again. There's a 90 percent chance you're getting that fastball again because you just told me you can't hit it. A lot of hitters, like I, as soon as I stopped thinking that all hitters were geniuses, that's when everything kind of started playing up as well. Because the hitters, like hitters and pitchers, are both the same way. They both think the other side are geniuses. They both think the other side has got this diabolical plan to trick them by going this and then this and this and then this and this and this. And it's just that's not what happens. If you swing and miss at a slider, I'm going to throw it again. And then until you start trying to catch up to it, then I'm going to throw a fastball. Or, and then I'm going to go fast and then I'm going to give him slower after that to a curveball. It's just it's that mix and match of trying to mix in times. Cause yeah, but if you swing and miss at a pitch, there's a 90% chance you're getting it again. <laughs> I won't tell anybody that. I mean, oh, I it's, a very, it's a very, it's a very basic plan. It's just one of those things <laughs> that everyone like over, as I said, everyone overthinks that their, their pitching methodology. So that all of a sudden, okay, well I, I threw a fastball, but and he swung and missed at that one. So he's going to be sitting on fastball. So I'm going to throw a slider. And then all of a sudden, they, they couldn't catch up to that because they were sitting slides. So the next time you throw a slider, they hit it 450 feet. So I, just, I got to the point where it's like, eh, 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 fastball. So that seems to be your mentality is, is to – you're just viewing it as a competition at that time, me versus hitter, and my job is just beat him. Like it's, it's just a physical – like more of a physical competition than a mental competition. And you're – it's just like a gladiator type thing. Yeah, I, I, I was like, I played catch this morning. I was talking to the kid I was playing catch with. And I was just saying like, yeah, like it used to be to the point where I was trying to play chess with checkers. So it's like, uh, and now it just uh, went to the point of like, no, I'm just playing chess. With, I'm playing checkers with checkers. I'm just going out there. I'm just, it's me versus him. There's no number. I don't care who's in the box. I'm going to beat that guy in that specific at bat. I know I'm better than him. I always put it like, I'm an egotistical narcissist on the mound when I pitch. Off the field, I feel like I'm relatively humble. I mean, probably not. But I feel like on the mound, like I am better than every single person that is on the other team, and I'm going to prove it to you every single night. And that's just how it's it's it been because, I mean, I'm sure you've spoken to other people. If you ever doubt your pitch, even if it's the correct pitch in the great location with everything going for it, it doesn't have the same weight as a guy who throws the wrong pitch with conviction. Absol absolutely. I do think some people think of it like – some people like to think one pitch at a time, I'm going to be a robot. I'm not going to show emotion. My job is just to throw the pitch where the catcher's calling it. I don't want to shake off. I don't want to do anything. Other people come to it like it's a cage match, me versus you. I'm going to beat you. I'm better than you. And I'm going to shove this ball down your throat. I think it could work for either one, um, but you have to do it in your personality. Like you were saying as a starter, you were more timid. And that's not your personality. Mm -hmm. So you're taking away one of your best attributes and muting it. Um, and I think coaches have to understand that, right? I mean, like as a coach, I can't expect you to not show emotion if you're Liam Hendricks, but I also can't expect Kyle Hendricks to sit there and yell and trash talk. Yeah, it's just one of those things. I think every team is now moving towards the individualization of both the approaches for pitches and specific workouts and training modules and all this, which has been a great trend to move into because it used to be the cookie gutter mold of, Oh, you're a generic right-handed pitcher. Uh, you're going to be a sinker slider guy with a good change up. That was like with the twins, the, their specific model was like the Kevin Slowey, Scott Baker, um, uh, Nick, um, I can't remember. He was one of their top prospects for a while. 
Uh, but he, um, yeah, it was all that same way. It was just going to be 90 to 92, sink a good change up and maybe mix in a slider or something like that to get him off that. And that was what you're going to be. And uh, that's what I kind of got typecast as myself. I typecast myself that I put a ceiling on myself. That's all I could ever be. I'm going to be your ground ball guy. That's going to be a hopeful, like, like number three, number four, number five guy in the rotation. And I never put that kind of, I never gave myself any credit for trying to move forward that. And then uh, that's what my wife and I always talk about. Like I used to put ceilings on myself. It used to be, well, okay, well now my goal in the bullpen is to try and strike out a hundred guys. And, my, and I just looked at her and was like, yeah, there's no way that happened. That's not the way I pitch. And she goes, why not? I'm sitting there like, uh, it's actually a good point. Like, why not? Like, why, <laughs> right. why is this unattainable? Why is this not a big thing where I can go out there and do this? And it's just that it turned into that, that kind of mindset of like, well, everything is like, oh, well, you can't do this. So why not? Like, why, why, what reason do you have for putting a, put a ceiling on myself? What reason do you have for anything going on? It's just, I think as, as soon as you start questioning absolutely everything, you get an, you get an idea of what your personality is. You get an idea of the way you want to attack things. And for me, it was, that, that takes out of the whole generalization of trying to make that cookie cutter mold. It's like, okay, well, yeah, day after you pitch is leg day. Well, why? Well, it's just the way we've always done it. It's like, no, that's not a good enough reason. Why? What, are the ben- what benefits are you giving me by doing legs the day after? Like, give me some sort of scientific or some sort of kind of backing as to the reasoning behind your decision. And that's where I love what I was able to do with Josh Cuffey and Terrence Brannick with the A's was go through and talk about workout plans, go through and talk about like issues and, why do you want me to do this? And then they go into a reason why I'm like, okay, now I get it. And then you go in there with a mindset of like, oh, okay, this is what I'm gaining from doing this exercise. That's why I'm doing it. This is what's going to make me better. Yeah. I feel like players are more empowered now with that. Like it used to be the coach was in charge. The, the, the front office is in charge. Now you have your own data. You have the, the codify stuff, which helps you, I think, mm-hmm. simplify the game um, mm-hmm. versus some people would obsess about it. And some people would sit there and go, you know, technically I need to do this. You're going at, you're using it as big picture. What do I need to, what do I need to do to attack this hitter? Um, but you're also able to customize your workout, customize your mentality, customize everything. And that's really brought out what's, what's best in you. Um, and I love that. I love to see pitchers take charge of their careers. Players take charge of their career. Cause you end up like who's in charge of your career now you are right. You're a free agent. It's like a cat. It's like catches and pitches. It's like, well, the catcher put it down, so I threw it. Well, the, well, but did you think it was the best pitch? No, but the catcher put it down. Well, is it, does it go against the catcher's ERA? Right? No, it goes against yours. So if you don't feel comfortable throwing that pitch, don't throw the bloody pitch. It's not that hard. Like it, it makes more sense if you like feel comfortable with whatever the hell you're throwing. Um, in saying that, there's certain times where I'll give, like, if I've told catchers in the past, hey, if you see something. And you put down, say, a fastball, and I'm thinking slider. If you put fastball down again, I'm going to throw it. Like, I'm, if, you, if you see a thing, but don't just put it down because this is the one you feel like. Just give me some – like, if you say, hey, this, I, I just don't think he's going to be able to hit one. Put it down. Let me throw it. And then if I get burned, it's still on me because I threw the pitch. But we're going to have a discussion about it. And if I shake to something and then I get hit – like, there was a game in Minnesota in 2019 – we ended up blowing the save. It was my third day in a row. And I still hadn't quite figured out my mentality on how to deal with that the third day in a row yet. Um, so I ended up blowing the save, gave up a couple of runs. And afterwards, I was like, my, boy, what happened? Like, like what happened? I was like, oh, every pitch. And so I, like the catcher came up to me. It was Feg- Josh Fegley. He came up to me and was like, hey, I actually appreciate that. I'm like, look, I'm not about to throw anybody under the bus if, if it is. It's like, no, I shook off every single pitch that you put down. And every single time I shook, they got a hit. It's not, <laughs> it's not on you. It's on me because it's poor execution. It wasn't on you. And I hate it when the catchers get a bad rep, especially with some of the coaching staffs, because it wasn't their decision. They may have put something down, but it's still not their decision to throw it. Yeah, it's funny. At younger levels, for example, high school baseball in the, in the U.S., even college baseball in the U.S., um, it's a lot of times the coach calling the pitches, and the, and the pitchers do not feel like they can shake off, at least in some, in some situations, which – gives you let i mean in the end if you give up a, a dinger on a on a fastball and the coach called it guess who's you know guess who's getting in trouble for that it's going to be you you own it yeah. um and it's just hard i love the idea of, of owning your own pitch and being able to uh to dictate what you throw because then you have 100 percent conviction and for you um you do not seem like a pitch to contact guy that just doesn't <laughs> seem like your mentality no if i get a guy to two strikes and he hit and he puts the ball in play i'm usually pissed 
Because <laughs> I did all the work to get you two strikes and then I go and screw it up. But no, especially to the high school and college thing, I love the fact of when I think at certain points, especially maybe in your first year, first two years of college, having someone call the pitches, having someone idea, because you don't really have an idea. Most people don't necessarily have an idea of the way they the way they pitch it. They haven't quite found themselves. And having an idea of that is is a long way. But as soon as you pass that, as soon as you become I can't remember what you people call high school, like the college names and sophomore and senior and all that crap. So yeah, yeah. um as soon as you, you get that, yeah. Just years three and four. As soon as you get to those years, that's when you're like, okay, now I need to take ownership of where I'm. This is the couple of years where I'm having a like I have a possibility of getting drafted. This is where I need to make sure that every coach and every scout out there knows that I'm calling what I do. So it's not just the coach putting the cat, the signs down for, for catches as well. He has an idea of how to game call. He has an idea of how to run a, run a, uh, run a pitching stuff. He has an idea of how to like kind of move around certain guys and pitch to contact at times. And then, and then maybe he had that ability to kind of strike a guy out in a big situation, but you need that ability because you see some of the catches getting into the game. They have no idea how to call their own game. Right. Like I still remember in the, uh, it was, I can't remember who it was. It was, in the GCL with the twins, like it was, he'd call a pitch and then he'd look straight in the dugout. And then he'd be like waiting there until like, and the coaches are like, no, call your own game. Well, he got so tired, cast into fastball, fastball, curveball, fastball, fastball, curveball. It was just like the same thing for every batter. It was just like every third pitch had to be an off speed, but the other two were fastballs. It was, he learned, I can't remember, I can't remember the guy's name, but he, he learned and he got, uh, he got a lot better. I'm like, I can't remember if he got to the big leagues or not, but he, he got a lot better at game calling. He was able to kind of move on and, it's all just through experience. The same way with pitching. You get that uh, – you finally figure out what works for you. And for me, it's just gripping and ripping and throwing as high as I can and then screaming at the other guy. Yeah, I mean, it used to be – it used to be you wouldn't even throw secondary pitches. It would be fastball, 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 set it up to basically set up and off speed, not throwing first pitch off speed. Things have changed a lot with analytics and just thinking about it. Like hitters have a tough time hitting sliders. So why would you not throw them a slider when you think you can get them out with? Yeah, there's no fastball counts anymore. Hitters complain about it all the time. Oh, it's a fa- like there's no fastball counts. Yeah, he threw me a three-o breaking ball. Well, shit, you've swung at every single three-o fastball this year. Why wouldn't they throw a breaking ball instead of giving up a double? Like, and they can throw a breaking ball. Maybe you'll swing. Maybe you don't. If it's a walk, it's a walk. You're only at first rather than second. I mean, it. You've done it to yourselves, hitters. Like, if you, it wasn't the pitches, it was the pitches making adjustments because you guys kept swinging. Like, I, I have no problem with uh, the Tatis Jr. Grand Slam against Texas because, you know what? Guarantee you the pitcher probably threw a first pitch breaking ball in there somewhere as well. And it's the same difference. You throw a first pitch breaking ball in a nothing game uh, with anybody, they have the ability then to swing 3 0 on the next guy. It's just that's how it goes. Like, if you can't just, it, it's, a bit of, it's bits and pieces of both. It's just, uh, there's, uh, there's, it's, not a, it's not a disrespect thing. It's not anything like that. It's about making sure, like, hey, look, we got to still play the game. I'm not giving up this game. I'm not giving up on that bat because like you, the, some of your guys on your team have struggled today. It's like, I'm not giving up. I'm not going to make it easy for you to get a hit off me because we're winning by a ton. No, you still have to earn that hit. And that's, what's going to happen. But by the way, do you ever swing the bat anymore? Do you can, how, how are you as a, uh, a hitter? If you were going to get in a bat right now, uh, I, I was very close to getting in that bat in 19 in San Francisco. I came into the game. We're up by three. Then we scored like three or two or three. And I was on deck. I was so excited because I haven't got a hit. All I want, that's the only one. I I just want a hit. I want, I want that ball. I want that ball put on my mantle. Um, But alas, there's been no such luck. Um, I feel like I'd be okay, but like it, at the end of the day, it's like, there was a, there was a time I'm going to toot my own home, but there was a time period where, James Beresford, who made it to the big leagues as a second baseman with the Minnesota Twins, he was the best pitcher in Australia. And I was the best hitter in Australia and made it to the big leagues as a pitcher. It was just that was a topsy-turvy year. But I was always – my name as a hitter was Ugly Power. I was just – it was an ugly swing, but I could hit it pretty far. Like, I guess you could say I was country strong as a kid. But, yeah, I had no uh, – if I was on, I was great. But if I was off, I was horseshit. I was so bad. <laughs> Like, I still remember, like, there was times where I got back from the National Carnival and I'm hitting for my team, and they're like, no, 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 you don't swing today. Like, just track the ball and see if you can figure it out. Because I went through from hitting 450 or 400 or whatever it was to almost hitting under 300 in the space of three games. It was just terrible. Like, I was so bad. And then we figured it out and I got back on track. But it was just, yeah, it's, it's when it rains, it pours, and 
when the bucket has a hole in it, there's no there's no rain that's being caught. So it's just uh, that's the way I was as a hitter. So do you, do you ever miss that? An do you, uh, do you ever miss, I miss it? I miss playing every day. So I miss like not being. I obviously as a reliever now, you get an opportunity to possibly be there in a, in there every day, which is great. But I miss playing every day. I miss the outfield. I feel like I'm a decent defensive outfielder. Uh, like that's why I power shake because I enjoy that. That's what I try and do. I try and get good reads and do all that. But um, yeah, I miss, I just miss playing every day. I miss kind of the natural grind, but I also in, much rather enjoy a pitcher, which is generally based a positive kind of position rather than a hitter where it's, if you get out seven out of 10 times, you're still a really good hitter. The other thing I think as a pitcher, you can be, I mean, you're in control of everything. You are, you're aggressive. You're on the, you know, you're, you're the one who's trying to attack the hitter. I think hitters sometimes almost like being a counter puncher sometimes. I mean, good hitters obviously are aggressive as well. And they're waiting for their pitch and going to, and going to hack. But if you take that mentality, it seems to fit with, with your mentality, probably what you're doing at the plate though, too, which is I'm going to hit everything out of the park and, and, and swing out of my shoes on everything. Yeah, I feel like I'd be a lot more analytical if I was a hitter. A lot more, okay, well, what, what does this guy like to throw? Oh, uh, How would you hit you? Uh, I'm just – I'd never get off the fastball. Like, I'd never get off the fastball, and then once I face myself a couple times and I realize that all I'm going to do is throw this guy a breaking ball because he never gets <laughs> off the fastball, I'd have to make the adjustment. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's – it's always thinking, like, as I said, like, there's a couple guys that I've played with that that is literally their motto at the plate. Never leave the fastball. They'll swing through two sliders and the hitter will be like, okay, well, he swung through two. I'm going to make sure I throw this fastball up and I'm going to get him because he's going to be sitting slider now, 450 foot homer because he just swung through two sliders and all of a sudden he gets his fastball. It's just, yeah, it's just, uh, you, you simplify the game and it gets a lot easier. Could you hit your own slider? I couldn't hit anything I throw. <laughs> But that's based a lot less on the fact of what I do on the mound is how I would be as at the plate. Like, I don't think I could hit anything. I feel like I just, uh, at this point in my career, I'd be way too long. I'd be trying to do too much. And then I've got like maybe a limited opportunity to get in that bat. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to grip it and rip it and try and hit as far as I can. Yeah, exactly. Or I do, I would screw myself and just do like a running bunch just to try and get a base hit so I can get on base and then just keep the ball. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so I know you're a big animal guy. And we've yeah. seen that we've seen Winnie. Um, what type of animal do you feel like you are when you're on the mound? Uh, I like to say shock. Uh, I like to say great white just because they're just floating through, floating through, floating through, floating through. And then all of a sudden they go nuts. I like that's real, that plays into my mentality a lot. I'm, I'll listen to music. I'll read a book in the clubhouse on the field, like off the field, like in the bullpen and stuff. I'm joking around the entire time, making fun of people making fun of myself a lot. I'm very self-deprecating, which I, I think is uh, endearing. Um, and then on the mound, like I'm still joking around, like I'll throw something and then be joking around with somebody else. And then, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's about it. And then all of a sudden I get on the mound and I'm a different person. I've got, my wife calls it white line fever. I've got white line fever that I'm just two different people. I'm a different person off the field than I am on the field. And I think that's, that's, that's a key to a lot of what I've been able to do is have different mentalities between, trying to get better and then on the mound where I'm not trying to get better I'm just trying to be better like I'm just I'm not trying to get anywhere I'm just I'm not trying to work on anything on the mound I'm trying to just destroy the other people the, the other person's soul on the other side I love that well thanks for all your time this has been uh absolutely great and that catapult finger I'm gonna have nightmares about it <laughs> <laughs> I find it do that I, again I, do that one more time that's uh, that's I don't geez. know what I don't know what like I don't know how it started. It had to be catching like, a football, no? Like a strong, like that's sick. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I th I, I think one of the tendons has got a little like up there. I, was, I mean, I probably get a bone. I got bone chips everywhere, so there's probably a little bit of a bone chip floating around in there. And then uh, yeah, yeah, it's just a little. Every, everyone has that one thing they can do at a party, and that's I got the catapult finger. Yeah, I got a fun mind. I, it's the pincer because I can do it that way. <laughs> Dude, that's like ridiculous. A little, like a scorpion's tail. I think I've come out of this with a bunch of new nicknames for you, though. I mean, there's the Great White, <laughs> there's Catapult, Catapult Finger Man, there's Pincher. I mean, like you got you got a lot of things going for you. 
Well, the funniest part is, is us. You know, Mark Zepchinski, uh, lefty yeah. reliever, was with the uh-huh. Cardinals and stuff. Yep. So we went on vacation with him, and his wife just got enamored with the fact the way I say shark. So she was like, yeah, the shark, shark, shark. So for Christmas, I got shark slippers. I got a cat riding a shark board shorts. I got a, do- like a dog riding a shark T-shirt. She went ham on the whole shark thing. Got some socks and... So I think, uh, yeah, I can't take Great White. I feel like that's already taken by old, old Greg Norman out there. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I'm, I'm sure we can figure out. Yeah, yeah, we can do something on that, right? Yeah, I'm sure we can figure out a moniker with, that includes Shark or Jaws or Snap or something. I don't know. All right, I'm going to be thinking about that. And if you think of anything, let me know. And that's your new name for this season. Wherever you wind up. I mean, I'm excited to see where you you wind up because... uh, Me too. Whoever whoever gets you is going to be just... like I've seen the teams that are looking at you, the names that you've you've mentioned. Anybody that gets you is going to be... uh, You take them to the next level, I would think. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, it's been a fun process, but uh, at the end of the day, I'm... I'm excited and hopeful that wherever I go will be a chance to win something. And that's what I want to do. I want to win a ring. And that's my bit. That's the big thing I want. I want to win a ring. I want to be, it doesn't, everything else comes second to that. I want to be on a team that has the, the option, like has the ability to win within the con. That's, that's my big thing now is trying to, and I also, the big thing I want to make sure is no matter what financial windfalls, whatever comes through that way, my mindset is going to be making sure that deal looks like a bargain. Regardless of anything else, I want to make sure that's that's the same mindset I took into 2000 uh, into 2020 was, you don't think I can repeat this? Watch me. It's the same thing. You don't think I'm worth this? Watch me. I'm going to make this thing look like a bargain, and then I'm going to be laughing. We're all going to be laughing all the way. That's that's a fantastic mentality. Some people have a hard time thinking they want to live up to the contract or whatever you're taking as a challenge versus a mm-hmm. pressure on you. Yeah, you're there's just no gonna- pressure on it. It's just a challenge. It's a challenge. I'm going to make sure that this is viewed as a bargain. I'm going to make sure I make sure like I'm going to be better than the contract. No matter what happens, I'm going to be better than I'm not just trying to get the value of it. I'm not going to just hopefully I live up to the value of it, the, what it's worth. I'm going to be better than it. And that's my, that's what I'm trying to do. Well, that's awesome. Thank you again for taking the time to, to talk. This has been fantastic. And uh, again, I'm going to be having nightmares about the cat- catapult <laughs> finger thing. I've never seen anything like that. Strike three, y'all!